I am back here to talk to you about the beginning of Queen Elizabeth's reign, her secret marriage to Robert Dudley, Earl of Leicester, and the concealed royal birth of the poet and philosopher known to the world as Francis Bacon, author of the Shakespeare works. For centuries, the world has been presented with the grandiose myth of Gloriana, the Virgin Queen, of which there have been many multifaceted versions. She has been variously depicted as the Virgin Goddess Astraea, Goddess of Innocence and Purity, the Triple Virgin Goddess Diana, the Imperial Virgin Empress of the Seas and the Virgin Queen who presided over the expansion into the New World, the goddess Pax, goddess of peace and justice, which she brought to her own people and country, nearly all of whom, of course, loved and admired her. In short, the Virgin Queen represented the golden age of English history, who in her own times and thereafter was built up into the all-powerful omniscient deity. One who was all-seeing and all-knowing, with eyes and ears everywhere throughout her kingdom and the continent of Europe who almost single-handedly ushered in the dawn of the modern world. As the very personification of this, she was portrayed through ubiquitous images, portraits and literature as an unrivalled beauty whose virginal purity and reputation would never fade with age or the passage of time. In recent times, the traditional view held by modernity of the Elizabethan reign has been subject to a process of re-examination and reassessment. For centuries, historians have presented a rose-tinted view of the period presided over by the so-called Virgin Queen Elizabeth, of dazzling intellect and beauty, who was religiously tolerant, whose reign was founded upon the love of the people during a mostly peaceful reign of some 45 years. This simplistic and shallow illusion is still presented by ill-informed and ignorant historians and biographers, as well as those who produce the seemingly endless dramas and English-speaking films about the so-called Virgin Queen and her reign. On the other hand, a growing number of more incisive historians and scholars have, based on the examination of primary docu documents, begun to penetrate the layers of illusion and dissimulation that has been carefully woven into the fabric of the glossy Elizabethan history presented to posterity. Their efforts have produced a substantial body of evidence which indicates that Elizabeth and her Machiavellian administration presided over a highly effective police state headed by her chief minister, Sir William Cecil, in the fight of Protestant England against the ubiquitous forces of Catholicism at home and abroad through a massive intelligence operation, which produced an oppressive and brutal regime, one cruelly affecting her own people, whatever their political and religious persuasion. Yet even these groundbreaking historians and academics have scarcely penetrated beneath the surface of Elizabethan history and the unnavigated hidden depths of the Shakespeare poems and plays, which when fully explored will unlock the deep and closely guarded secrets of the age which produce them. The simplistic and outdated view of Elizabethan history has also affected how we largely see and evaluate some key Elizabethan figures. Beginning, of course, with the Virgin Queen herself, her favourite in the first half of her, of her reign, Robert Dudley, Earl of Leicester, and in the final years of her reign, Robert Devereux, Earl of Essex, and the intellectual colossus and towering figure of the age, Francis Bacon, whose intertwined and hidden relationships constitute the very key for unlocking the secrets of the age.
The first and greatest lie of, of her reign, an endlessly repeated myth of the age, was the presentation of Elizabeth as the Virgin Queen, herself a master of dissimulation and deception, which was supported and surrounded by a subtle and nuanced propaganda machine, then and now presenting her as a Protestant alternative to the Catholic Virgin Mary. The cult of Elizabeth, imbued with all its religious and political symbolism, was one of incredible complexity generated by a vast propaganda machine, supported by elaborate spectacle and ceremonial displays, countless fantastic portraits and images, all radiating her power and magnificence. This ubiquitous iconography was supported by an enormous body of poetry and literature, which was seen as critical for winning the hearts and minds of her loyal subjects, the fear and admiration of other kingdoms and princes of Europe, and for securing the triumph of Protestantism over Catholicism to determine the future direction of the world. It would be difficult to overestimate the importance of the divine myth surrounding the figure of the Virgin Queen Elizabeth, not only in the time she lived, but also over the following centuries, as England established itself as the main bulwark against a Catholic hegemony which stretched over the known world. She formed the symbolic figurehead of the emerging British Empire, the largest empire the world has ever seen, after whom the state of Virginia, the site of the first permanent English settlement, was named, that eventually evolved into the United States of America, the most powerful nation in the history of mankind, thus personifying the dawn of a new world. It was primarily through the vast expanse of the British Empire, the English language became the universal language of the world, the vehicle of those immortal Shakespeare poems and plays, which today are known throughout every corner of the globe. There was so much that depended on the myth of the Virgin Queen that once it was conceived and established, it was necessary for interrelated and evolving reasons to deliberately sustain and maintain it down the centuries, all the way through to our own times. This enduring myth of the Virgin Queen is still peddled by Orthodox historians and scholars the world over, portrayed as such in universities and schools, TV dramas and films, and in the broadsheet and tabloid press. A myth built upon a massive lie and, and a fraud of gargantuan proportions, and, as we have learned, if you tell a big enough lie and keep on repeating it, nearly everybody ends up believing it. This was the first and greatest lie of the Elizabethan reign, which determined the shape and direction of the whole of the period, which has and still continues to shape the last five centuries of English history. The dissembling and duplicitous Virgin Queen did not live her life as a virgin, nor did she remain unmarried and childless. As we shall see, she married her lover and favourite, Lord Robert Dudley, with whom she had two children, the eldest known to the world as Francis Bacon, and thus heir to the English throne, and his royal brother known as Robert Devereux, the second Earl of Essex. It is only when we understand the true relationship between Queen Elizabeth and her two concealed sons, Francis and Robert, can we truly comprehend the complex reasons for the subsequent events that shaped and defined her reign, and the first of varied and complex reasons why her son Francis concealed his authorship of the Shakespeare plays. The so-called Virgin Queen was a Machiavellian actor, a master of dissimulation, one who knew how to appear and where necessary lied as she breathed. Those who were close to her knew what she knew, knew she was not a virgin, knew she was married and knew she had two children with her secret husband, Lord Robert Dudley. These were all state secrets, ones known to some contemporary Elizabethan historians and by more modern academics and scholars, who for centuries have secretly withheld the truth about the two intertwined myths of Elizabeth and her son, Francis Tudor Bacon.
Everyone sees what you appear to be. Few really know what you are. Nothing is more revolting in the Queen than her shameless mendacity. It was an age of political lying, but in the profusion and recklessness of her lies, Elizabeth stood without peer in Christendom. It was a misfortune of Elizabeth's stratagems that she de deceived her friends as well as her enemies. You can fool all the people some of the time, and some of the people all of the time, but you cannot fool all the people all the time. On the 17th of November 1558, Queen Mary died, a date that proved historically crucial for the future direction of England, Europe and the rest of the world, when replaced on the English throne by her sister Elizabeth, whose reign still continues to reverberate down the ages to the present day. At the outset of Elizabeth's accession, her lover Robert Dudley was among the witnesses to the surrender of the Great Seal at Hatfield on the morning of the 18th of November. The same day, Dudley was appointed Master of the Horse, the first of many positions, titles, preferments, enormous gifts and grants of land and property given to him by his lover Queen Elizabeth, as well as untold revenues and monies, making him one of the most powerful and wealthiest persons in the kingdom. She also immediately appointed William Cecil, her principal secretary of state, and afterwards his brother-in-law, Nicholas Bacon, Lord Keeper of the Great Seal, with all the powers of the Lord Chancellor of England, who were the grand architects of the Elizabethan Protestant Reformation. At the state opening of Parliament in January 1559, the Lord Keeper, Sir Nicholas Bacon, in his opening address, called for moderation and tolerance in matters of religion and to restore peace and prosperity to the country. In the important act of supremacy, Elizabeth declared herself Supreme Governor of the Church of England and instituted an oath of supremacy requiring all public and church officials to swear allegiance to the monarch as head of church and state. Furthermore, the Treason Act made it a treasonable offence to even imagine to deprive the monarch or her heirs of the crown or destroy her or her heirs. In the 1559 Parliament, Elizabeth told all those before her she had decided to remain unmarried. It shall be for me sufficient that a marble stone should, be de should declare that a queen, having reigned such a time, lived and died a virgin. It was a grand statement that would doubtless have raised a few eyebrows and a few smiles by those who knew better. It was the first great lie of her reign and it would certainly not be the last. Beyond those who knew the true status of the secret relationship of Elizabeth and Dudley in the spring of 1559, increasing rumours amongst courtiers and ambassadors concerning their inappropriate behaviour were circulating around the Elizabethan court and the courts of Europe. On the 18th of April 1559, the Spanish ambassador Count de Feria wrote to his master King Philip II telling him, During the last few days, Lord Robert has come so much into favour that he does whatever he likes with affairs, and it is even said that Her Majesty visits him in his chamber day and night. People talk so freely that they go so far as to say that his wife has a malady in one of her breasts, and the Queen is only waiting for her to die to marry Lord Robert. A master of dissimulation in public, Queen Elizabeth was doing her best to keep up appearances at a time when she was going through the pretense of considering marriage with the Archduke Ferdinand, whilst her private inner circle knew she only truly had eyes for Dudley. Later that month, on the 29th of April, de Feria wrote again to his master.
Sometimes she appears to want to marry him and speaks like a woman who will only accept a great prince. And then they say she's in love with Lord Robert and never lets him leave her. Taking care to write in cipher, Paolo Taipolo, Venetian ambassador to Philip II, reported to the Doge and the Senate that Elizabeth personally attended the ceremony where Dudley was knighted along with three others. Lord Robert Dudley, master of the horse and son of the late Duke of Northumberland, is a very handsome young man, towards whom in various ways the Queen of Italy has such affection and inclination that many young persons believe that if his wife, who has been ailing for some time, were perchance to die, the Queen might easily take him for her husband. It was now routinely whispered at court and in foreign diplomatic circles that Queen Elizabeth and Dudley were indulging in a sexual relationship. On the 10th of May 1559, the Venetian ambassador Schifanoia, aware that his letters might be intercepted, wrote to the Castellan of Mantua. My Lord Robert is in very great favour and very intimate with Her Majesty. On this I ought to report the opinion of many, but I doubt whether my letters may not miscarry or be read, wherefore it is better to keep silence than to speak ill. On the 10th of May, Spanish Ambassador de Feria reported to Philip that he had forgotten to write on St George's Day, when Norfolk, the Marquis of Northampton, the Earl of Rutland and Lord Robert were created Knights of the Order, before informing him The Secretary Cecil, Bacon, the Treasurer of the Household and Lord Robert rule everything. The Spanish Ambassador de Feria was succeeded by Bishop de Quadra, who in the November reported to Philip II that Lord Robert was planning to poison his wife and foretold in a manner that would characterise much of her reign that Queen Elizabeth was merely playing with the powers of Europe and her royal suitors. I have learned from a person who usually gives me true information that Lord Robert has sent instructions to have his wife poisoned and, has, and that all the dallying with us, all the dallying with the Swede, all the dallying there will be with the rest, one after another, is merely to keep Lord Robert's enemies in play till his villainy about his wife can be executed. I have learned also certain other things as to the terms on which the Queen and Lord Robert stand towards each other, which I could not have believed. The Duke of Norfolk is the leader of Lord, Rob Lord Robert's enemies, who are in fact all the greatest persons in the realm, and the Duke says Lord Robert shall never die in his bed unless he gives over his preposterous pretensions of being King of England. After negotiating the Treaty of Edinburgh, drawn up on the 5th of July 1560, between the English Commission headed by Cecil, the Scottish Lords of the Congregation, and French representatives of Francis II, husband of Mary, Queen of Scots, who had a strong claim to the English throne, Cecil headed back to London, where he was met with a cool reception from Elizabeth and her lover Dudley. While Cecil had been away, Elizabeth and Dudley's love affair and sexual relationship further intensified, resulted in momentous developments behind the scenes that soon came to his attention. The so-called Virgin Queen was pregnant by Dudley, a situation which had potentially enormous implications for the succession and the security of the country and balance of power in Europe. Who knew what and when cannot now be precisely determined, but we can be fairly confident that it was known to Principal Secretary of State Cecil and his brother-in-law, Lord Keeper, Sir Nicholas Bacon, some senior members of the Privy Council and other key figures in the Elizabethan administration, and at some point a number of foreign ambassadors and diplomats.
Beyond those in the knowledge circle, news and rumours began to spread outside of the court and around the country, fanned and repeated in the mouths of members of the great English public. It would not take too long before rumours of a royal pregnancy, openly spoken of in different parts of the country, reached the ears of the Secretary of State Cecil. He obtained a formal written report dated 13th of August 1560 from Lord Rich stating that one Mother Dow of Brentwood had openly asserted that Queen Elizabeth was with child by Robert Dudley, the first of at least eight offenders to be sent to prison for even daring to say it out loud. Concerned with the widespread nature of these statements, both Cecil and his brother-in-law, Lord Keeper Nicholas Bacon, and senior members of the Elizabethan regime, were determined to dampen down any further talk of Elizabeth's pregnancy among the people of her realm, but more importantly, as the days passed, foreign ambassadors and diplomats caught wind of the situation, and it was now spreading across the major courts of Europe. The developing circumstances were becoming increasingly dangerous for Elizabeth in terms of protecting her life and her crown. If she were to have a bastard son, the consequences would doubtless be very grave in a country bitterly divided politically and religiously. There would almost certainly have been a Roman Catholic reaction both at home and abroad, and even some of her own Protestant subjects might favour a Catholic Mary Queen of Scots when faced with the prospect of an adulterous queen pregnant with an illeg illegitimate child conceived out of wedlock with a widely unpopular man still married to another woman. Elizabeth and Dudley were now in a serious bind and were looking for a solution to a mounting problem that threatened to completely overwhelm and consume them. One critically important part of the problem was Lady Amy Robsart Dudley, whose days as things then stood at the outset of August 1560 were fatally numbered. She was a dead woman walking. On the 8th of September 1560, Lady Amy Robsart Dudley was found dead with a broken neck at the bottom of some stairs at Cumnor Place, Oxfordshire. The house was leased by Anthony Foster, chief controller of Dudley's expenses, who lived there with his wife. At Cumnor, Lady Dudley had a household of ten servants and two other gentlewomen, a Mrs Owen and a Mrs Odingsells. On the day of her death, with Mr and Mrs Foster already absent, Lady Dudley is said to have given permission for her entire household to visit Abingdon Fair. Three ladies decided not to go to Abingdon, and according to one report, they were all playing a game of cards when Lady Dudley heard her name called from the hall, which she thought sounded like the voice of her husband Dudley. Leaving the room, she went to the staircase landing and leant over the balustrade, which apparently gave way, and she fell head first into the, onto the stone paving below. Later in the day, when her servants returned from Abingdon, they found Lady Dudley dead at the bottom of the stairs with a broken neck and two wounds to her head. To her head. At the time, Elizabeth and Dudley were together at Windsor Castle and were told of her demise by messenger on the 9th of September. The coroner's jury found Lady Dudley had died of a fall and delivered a verdict of accidental death. It was, however, widely suspected Dudley had orchestrated her death, and according to the anonymous author of Leicester's Commonwealth, the earliest printed account of the tragedy, Dudley used for his instrument his follower, Sir Richard Verney, who carried out the murder. A truly remarkable letter from Spanish Ambassador de Quadra, written to the Duchess of Parma, dated 11th of September 1560, provides an account of a conversation with Cecil, which took place prior to the death of Lady Amy Dudley, confirming Cecil was aware that Dudley was intending to murder his wife, with whom Elizabeth conspired and was complicit in the plot. The Lord Robert has made himself master of the business of the state and of the person of the Queen to the extreme injury of the realm with the intention of marrying her and she herself was shutting herself up in the palace to the peril of her health and her life. 
Of Lord Robert, he twice said he would be better off in paradise than here. He told me the Queen cared nothing for foreign princes. She did not believe that she stood in any need of their support. Last of all, he said that they were thinking of destroying Lord Robert's wife. They had given out that she was ill, but she was not ill at all. She was very well and was taking care not to be poisoned. God, he trusted, would never permit such a crime to be accomplished or allow so wicked a conspiracy to prosper. The day after this conversation, i.e. 4th of September, four days before the murder of Lady Amy, the Queen, on her return from hunting, told me that Lord Robert's wife was dead, or nearly so, and begged me not to say anything about it. With the death of Lady Amy, the way was open for Elizabeth and Dudley to marry in private, meaning that the child the pregnant Queen was carrying would be born in wedlock. With the national scandal surrounding the circumstances of Lady Amy's death reverberating around the kingdom and the royal courts of Europe, it was personally and politically impossible for Elizabeth to publicly marry the notorious widower and suspected murderer, who was widely hated by the nobility and the people. The precise date of their private marriage is uncertain, but it most likely occurred shortly after the death of Lady Amy, possibly as Alfred Dodd presents it, within a few days. Shortly afterwards, on the 12th of September, Dudley and the Queen were private, privately married at Brook House, Hackney, belonging to the Earl of Pembroke, Sir Nicholas and Lady Bacon being witnesses. According to Bacon's word cipher, the marriage of Queen Elizabeth to Robert Dudley was told to him by his foster mother, Lady Anne Bacon, as related below. The Queen took this man of evil and was married to him like a beggar under a bush, not in a church, but in secret. My gentle Lord Nicholas Bacon performing the marriage service. Did you the Queen's wedding attend? I and I alone of all the attending train of Eliza's fair ladies, in company of my Lord Pickering, saw her nuptial. The secret private marriage of Elizabeth and Dudley, deciphered above by Dr Owen, is revisited by Bacon in his biliteral cipher in The Advancement of Learning, as deciphered by Elizabeth Wells Gallup. Queen Elizabeth, the late sovereign, wedded secretly to the Earl, my father, at the Tower of London, and afterwards at the house of Lord P. This ceremony was repeated, but not with any of the pomp and ceremony that sorteth well with queenly espousals, yet with a sufficient number of witnesses. The secret private marriage of Elizabeth and Dudley was of course known to the Earl of Pembroke and Sir Nicholas and Lady Bacon. Doubtless it was also known to their brother-in-law, Principal Secretary of State William Cecil and other senior members of the Privy Council, her gentlewomen of the Privy Chamber and some members of the Royal Household and most likely a few of Dudley's trusted servants. Knowledge, news and rumour of it inevitably began to be whispered in and around the court and it soon reached the ears of foreign ambassadors and diplomats who relayed what they knew and had heard back to their respective royal masters and other senior, senior dignitaries throughout the courts of Europe. On the 12th of November 1560, Duquadra wrote to his royal master Philip II. The design of Cecil and the heretics is to make the Earl of Huntingdon king, and Cecil has given way to Robert, who they say was married to the Queen in the presence of his brother, meaning Sir Nicholas Bacon, and two ladies of the chamber. As the Elizabethan historian Froude put it, de Quadra reported that there were anxious meetings of the council. The courtiers paid a partial homage to Dudley, while Cecil and the Protestants, in dread of imminent convulsion, thought of pressing the Queen to declare Huntingdon her successor. It was rumoured, seemingly on Lord Robert's authority, that some private but formal betrothal had passed between the Queen and himself. Some of de Quadra's letters later came to the attention of Elizabeth and her ministers, and the Spanish ambassador was afterwards summoned before the Lord Chamberlain and Dr Watton to answer a number of specific charges made against him. 
The sixth of these, and the one which is of interest to us, is recorded in the minutes as follows. Number six, that I had written to His Majesty Philip II that the Queen had been secretly married to Lord Robert at the Earl of Pembroke's house. Answer. What I wrote to His Majesty about this was the same as I said to the Queen, which was that people were saying all over the town that the wedding had taken place, which at the time neither surprised nor annoyed her. News of events soon reached the French court in Paris, where the murder of Lady Amy at the hands of those acting on behalf of her husband Dudley and his marriage to Elizabeth was on everybody's lips. The English ambassador to France, Sir Nicholas Throckmorton, was well acquainted with the news of Amy's death and the rumours of a secret marriage between Elizabeth and Dudley. He wrote to Cecil on the 28th of October. The rumours be so brim and so maliciously reported here touching the marriage of the Lord Robert and the death of his wife, as I know not where to turn or what countenance to bear. In a letter to Cecil dated 31st of December 1560, Throckmorton indicates that he knows the rumours of a marriage between Elizabeth and Dudley are true, and that he is aware that it's the talk of all Europe. But if Her Majesty do so foully forget herself in her marriage as the brute runneth here, never think to bring anything to pass either here or elsewhere. I would you did hear the lamentations, the declamations and sundry affections which of course here for that matter. Remember, your mistress is young and subject to affectations. You are her sworn counsellor and in great credit with her. You know that there be some of your colleagues which have promoted the matter. My duty to her, my goodwill to you, doth thus move me to speak plainly. After I had written thus much, the ambassador of Spain came to visit me, who did amongst other matters earnestly require me to tell him whether the Queen's Majesty was not secretly married to Lord Robert, for, said he, I assure you, this court is full of it. The brutes of her doings, said he, be very strange in all courts and countries. In the entry for Robert Dudley in the Dictionary of National Biography, Sir Sidney Lee writes, Whatever were the Queen's relations with Dudley before his wife's death, they became closer after it. It was reported that she was formally betrothed to him and that she had secretly married him in Lord Pembroke's house and that she was a mother already, January 1561. Apparently, documentary proof of their marriage remained in the Pembroke family for centuries until it was destroyed by Queen Victoria. When Queen Victoria was staying at Wilton House, the Earl of Pembroke told her that in the monument room was a document which formed written evidence that in 1560 Elizabeth I married the Earl of Leicester. The marriage was performed in secret oath of absolute secrecy. At the time of that marriage, the Queen was pregnant by Lord Leicester. Queen Victoria demanded that this document should be produced and, after she had examined it, she put it on the fire, saying, One must not interfere with history. This information was given to me by the 15th Earl of Pembroke, the grandfather of the present Earl. One possibility for making a public marriage more acceptable was to garner the support of Philip II of Spain, with whom Dudley had a relationship stretching back to the reign of Philip's English wife, Mary I of England. He thought by enlisting Catholic Spanish help to publicly legitimise his private union with Elizabeth, it might persuade her to take the final step and openly make him Prince Consort or King of England. On the 22nd of January, 1561, de Quadra wrote to his royal master, Philip II, to inform him that Sir Henry Sidney, apparently speaking for his brother-in-law brother Dudley and Elizabeth, had asked him whether Philip would provide support for a public marriage if Elizabeth and Dudley promised to restore the Roman Catholic religion in England.
There came lately to see me Sir Henry Sidney, who is married to Lord Robert's sister, a high-spirited, noble sort of person, and one of the best men that the Queen has about the court. After speaking generally on ordinary matters, he came to the affair of his brother-in-law, and the substance of his words to me was this. The marriage was now in everybody's mouth, he said, and the Queen, I must be aware, was very anxious for it. He said the Queen could not begin the subject with me, but I might assure myself she waited for nothing but Your Majesty's consent to conclude the marriage. Of this I am certain, that if she marry Lord Robert without Your Majesty's sanction, Your Majesty has to but give a hint to her subjects and she will lose her throne. I know how, how this matter really stands, and I know the humour of the people. But I am certain also that without Your Majesty's sanction she will do nothing in public. And some say she's a mother already. On the very day de Quadra wrote to Philip II in a letter which reports that it is being said by some that Queen Elizabeth is a mother already, she gave birth on the 22nd of January 1561 to a boy, an event and whose true identity has remained an official state secret for five centuries, though it was a secret his earliest biographer, Pierre Ambios, and his first English biographer, Dr William Rawley, enigmatically revealed to us. The Church of England clergyman, Dr William Rawley, knew the truth and secrets of the concealed and hidden life of who the world and posterity knows as Francis Bacon, including that of his secret royal birth and concealed authorship of the Shakespeare works. From at least 1660 onwards, Dr Rawley served Francis Bacon as his private secretary and chaplain right up until Bacon's death in 1626, only three years after Bacon had dedicated the first folio of the Shakespeare works to the third Earl of Pembroke and the Earl of Montgomery, whose grandfather William, first Earl of Pembroke, witnessed the marriage of Elizabeth and Dudley. In his own words, Dr Rawley served as a daily instrument to Bacon assisting him in the composing of his works for many years together, especially in his writing time, I conceived that no man could pretend a better interest or claim to the ordering of them after his death than myself. He was also a witness to Bacon's last will and testament and entrusted with a large number of Bacon's manuscripts. In the months following Bacon's supposed death to the world, Dr Rawley compiled and published a commemorative work in his honour entitled The Memori, otherwise known as the Mains Verilumiani. This rare volume contains 32 Latin verses in praise of Bacon, with an introduction by Rawley, whose contents Bacon's biographers and editors have suppressed to the present day. Several of these verses portray Bacon as a secret supreme poet and dramatist of comedies and tragedies, under the pseudonym Shakespeare. As revealing as these remarkable verses already are, in his address to the reader, Dr Rawley plainly states that he has deliberately withheld many from the public view. What my Lord, the Right Honourable Viscount St Alban, valued most, that he should be dear to seats of learning and to men of letters, that I believe he has secured, since these tokens of love and memorials of sorrow prove how much his loss grieves their heart. And indeed, with no stinted hand have the muses bestowed on him this emblem, for the very many poems and the best too I withhold from publication. The contributors to the memoir include a number of scholars from Cambridge and Oxford universities, as well as numerous writers, poets and dramatists. A number of them were written anonymous, anonymously or signed with only their initials and have never been identified. The verse below, signed by R.P., compares Bacon to the legendary poet Orpheus and alludes to the immortal comedies and tragedies of his Shakespeare plays and Astraea, the virgin goddess of justice, who is often associated with Queen Elizabeth. As Eurydice, wandering through the shades of Dis, longed to, to caress Orpheus, so did philosophy, entangled in the subtleties of schoolmen, seek Bacon as a deliverer, with such winged hand as Orpheus, lightly touching the lyre's strings. 
Nor did he with workmanship her fussy meddler's patch, but he renovated her, walking lowly in the shoes of comedy. After that, more elaborately, he rises on the loftier tragic buskin. From the tripod of law go on uttering oracles for the disciples of Themis. Thus, blessed inhabitants of heaven, let Astraea enjoy her in champion of old, or with bacon give back Astraea. The goddess Astraea, often associated with Queen Elizabeth in poetry, portraiture and pageantry, is again likened to Bacon in verses 10 and 30. The glorious spirit follows Astraea and now beholds all cloudless the true Verulam, Bacon. What? Do then the gods need the wisdom of Bacon, or has Astraea left the gods? His close and inward friend, Sir William Boswell, a literary executor of Bacon's will, to whom Bacon bestowed many of his unpublished Latin and English writings, likens him to the goddess of law, Themis, and the Greek goddess Pallas, i.e. Pallas Athena, the shaker of the spear from whom Bacon adopted the pseudonym Shakespeare. No inhabitant of earth was master of greater intellectual gifts, nor does any survivor so skillfully united Themis and Pallas, while he flourished, the sacred choir of the muses, influenced by these arts, poured forth all their eloquence in his praise. Lord Keeper of the Seal, Bishop John Williams, to whom Bacon in his will bequeathed all his letters and speeches, likens Bacon to Apollo, god of poetry and leader of the nine muses, the goddesses who presided over the different kinds of poetry. How has it happened to us, the disciple of the muses, that Apollo, the leader of our choir, should die? In the longest of the verses in the Memorai, the poet and dramatist Thomas Randolph emphatically confirms that Bacon is the supreme poet Shakespeare. He too likens him to the goddess Minerva, the Roman equivalent of Pallas or Pallas Athena, from whom Bacon took his nom de plume Shakespeare and Apollo, the god of poetry and leader of the muses, and the Roman god Quirinus, meaning the wielder of the spear, Shakespeare. When he persuades Eve that the arts were held by no roots, and like seeds scattered on the surface of the soil were withering away, he taught the Pegasian arts to grow, as grew the spear of Quirinius swiftly into a laurel tree. Therefore, since he has taught the Heliconian goddesses to flourish, no lapse of ages shall dim his glory. The ardour of his noble heart could bear no longer that you, divine Minerva, should be despised. His godlike pen restored your wonted honour, and as another Apollo dispelled the clouds that hid you. In the same year that Dr. Rawley quietly issued the Memorai, he also published Bacon's Utopia, New Atlantis, the land of the Rosicrucians, the blueprint on which the United States of America was modelled upon, which was initially founded in Virginia, named after the so-called Virgin Queen Elizabeth. Around the emblem on the title page of the Rosicrucian New Atlantis appears the following inscription. In time, the hidden truth will be revealed. The New Atlantis was the coeval of the anonymous Fama Fraternitatis, written by Bacon, the first manifesto of the secret Rosicrucian Brotherhood, of which Dr. Rawley was a member under his beloved Rosicrucian Grandmaster, Lord Bacon. This first Rosicrucian manifesto was printed at Castle in German under the magnificent title of The Universal Reformation of the Whole World. The title of one of its tracks, in which the god Apollo, to whom Bacon is likened above, invites advice from the wise men of antiquity and modern times for the benefit of mankind. In 1615 appeared the second anonymous Rosicrucian manifesto written by Bacon, printed at Castle in Latin, entitled The Confession of the Laudable Fraternity of the Most Honourable Order of the Rosy Cross, Written to All the Learned of Europe.
The German Fama and Latin Confession were first printed in English in 1652, issued under the pseudonym of Eugenius Philalethes, Thomas Vaughan, which deliberately omitted a very critical piece of information from the following passage. This line at a single stroke exposes and demolishes the myth and illusion of the false authorship of the Shakespeare works. The following, directly translated from the original 1615 Latin Confessio Fraternitatis by Arthur E. Waite, includes the critical sentence not included in the above. For conclusion of our confession, we must earnestly admonish you that you cast away, if not all, yet most of the worthless books of pseudo-chemists, to whom it is a jest to apply the most holy trinity to vain things or to deceive men with monstrous symbols and enigmas, or to profit by the curiosity of the credulous. Our age doth produce many such, one of the greatest being a stage player, a man with sufficient ingenuity for imposition. Such doth the enemy of human welfare mingle among the good seed, thereby to make the truth more difficult to be believed, which in herself is simple and naked, while falsehood is proud, haughty, and coloured with a luster of seeming godly and humane wisdom. In the first 1652 English translation of the Confession, the one used for nearly all later modern editions, including by Dr Yates in the Rosicrucian Enlightenment, after stating false alchemists easily deceive the people, it omits the line below translated by Waite from the original 1615 Latin edition. Our age doth produce many such, one of the greatest being a stage player, a man with sufficient ingenuity for imposition. The stage player that easily deceived the people of the Elizabethan and Jacobean era was the Stratford actor William Shakespeare, who was employed by Francis Bacon for the literary mask of William Shakespeare. In addition to the Memorai and New Atlantis, Dr Rawley continued to edit, translate and publish various editions of Lord Bacon's writings, culminating in the Resuscitato or bringing into public light several pieces of the works, civil, historical, philosophical and theological, hitherto sleeping, to which he prefixed the first English life of Lord Bacon. In his address to the reader, Dr Rawley primes the initiated. In regard of the distance of the time since his lordship's days, whereby I shall not tread too near upon the heels of truth, or of the passages and persons then concerned. In keeping with his Rosicrucian master, Lord Bacon, Dr Rawley delivers as much of the truth as he is able via a method of delivery, at once enigmatical and disclosed, or simultaneously concealed and revealed, that can be easily read by those possessing a penetrating intellect or eyes to see, to enable them to pierce the carefully constructed veil, a method he employs in the very first sentence of the life of his master. Francis Bacon, the glory of his age and nation, the adorner and ornament of learning, was born in York House or York Place in the Strand on the 22nd day of January in the year of our Lord, 1561. It will be observed that curiously, Dr Rawley pointedly says that Bacon was born at York House or York Place, which are two separate buildings, and as he was perfectly aware, carried absolutely different meanings and implications for the filial antecedents concerning the secret life of the man who had entrusted him with them. 
In Elizabethan England, the mansion York House on the Strand was the official residence of the Lord Keeper of the Great Seal of England, the office first held in the Elizabethan reign by Sir Nicholas Bacon, who occupied it for some 20 years from 1559 until his death in 1579, and was after, afterwards the official re residence of Francis as Lord Keeper and Lord Chancellor with whom Dr Rawley resided. The York House mansion was set within grounds adjacent to those of the Royal Palace at York Place, Queen Elizabeth's Palace, the main residence of English monarchs from the early 16th century, now the site of the Palace of Whitehall, comprising a range of government buildings including the Cabinet Office and Ministry of Defence. Dr Rawley, who lived and spent several years with Bacon at York House when he was Lord Keeper and Lord Chancellor of England, knew the difference between York House and York Place, the royal residence of Queen Elizabeth, and was privy to the secret of his royal birth. He had gone as close to the hills of truth as he might dare by directly suggesting there was some kind of mystery regarding his birth by pointing to York Place, the royal palace of Queen Elizabeth, secret mother of Francis Bacon. The first English Life of Bacon by Dr Rawley pointed to his royal birth and the first Life of Bacon published in French repeatedly confirmed it. The French Life appeared in Paris in 1631 and was prefixed to what appeared to be a French translation of Bacon's natural history, Silver Silverum. The French Life contains information not found in any other biography of Bacon, some of it either provided by Bacon himself or somebody very close to him. For 400 years, this rare life of Bacon has been systematically suppressed by his orthodox editors and biographers for reasons that are about to become only all too clear. What is it then about the earliest life of Bacon, aside from the ignorance of ordinary biographers and commentators, that has apparently motivated his major editors and biographers to effectively suppress certain lines and passages within it for the last 400 years? Why on earth and for what reason would they go to such lengths, lengths to obscure and conceal them? What were they trying to hide and withhold from the rest of the world for nearly half a millennium? Answer, the first secret of Bacon's life, the secret of his royal birth. For the literal and superficial, it begins with a reference to his father being the Lord Keeper, before intermingling striking and unmistakable allusions to his secret royal birth, born of the very regal and royal monarch Queen Elizabeth. Monsieur Bacon was not only obliged to imitate the virtues of such a one, but also those of many others of his ancestors, who have left so many marks of their greatness in history that honour and dignity seem to have been at all times the spoil of his family. Certain it, certain it is that no one can reproach him with having added less than they to the splendour of his race, being thus born in the purple. I wish to state that he employed many years of his youth in travel in order to polish his mind and to mould his opinion by intercourse with all kinds of foreigners. France, Italy and Spain, as the most civilised nations of the whole world, were those whither his desire for knowledge carried him. And as he saw himself destined one day to hold in his hands the helm of the kingdom, instead of looking only at the people and the different fashions in dress, as do the most of those who travel, he observed judiciously the laws and the customs of the countries through which he passed, noted the different forms of government in a state with their advantages or defects, together with all the other matters which might help to make a man able for the government of men. There is clearly in the above passage several phrases and observations which point to, to and confirm that Francis Bacon, or should we say Francis Tudor, was of royal birth. Firstly, it explicitly and directly refers to his ancestors who have left so many marks of their greatness in history that honour and dignity seem to have been at all times the spoil of his family. It is completely without any doubt whatsoever that this does not refer to the ancestors of Sir Nicholas and Lady Anne Bacon 
They came of relatively modest and humble stock, none of whom left any marks of greatness in history. So what kind of ancestors leave so many marks of their greatness in history that honour and dignity seem to have been at all times the spoil of his family? A description consistent with the Tudor royal family which derived its ancestry from the houses of York and Lancaster. Henry IV, Henry V, Henry VI, Edward IV, Richard III, Henry VII and Henry VIII. All reigns covered by Bacon in his Shakespeare plays and prose history of Henry VII that clearly left countless marks of their greatness in history. To unmistakably reinforce and confirm the illusion that Bacon was born of royalty, his first biographer then explicitly states he was born in the purple. As everybody knows, purple is the colour of royalty, and Queen Elizabeth herself forbade anyone except close members of the royal family to wear it. Thus, in other words, Bacon was born in the purple to royalty, a glaring confirmation that he was the royally born son of Queen Elizabeth. His biographer declares, moreover, that Bacon saw himself destined one day to hold in his hands the helm of the kingdom, helm in control or head of the country, meaning as son and heir of Queen Elizabeth that one day he was destined to be king of England and that he had from a young man studied in all forms of government in anticipation of his role as royal head of state for the governance of his kingdom. Now that Queen Elizabeth and Lord Robert Dudley were privately married, they had the enormous problem of whether to make their marriage public. It will be recalled that in the previous letter by de Quadra to Philip II on the 22nd of January, he assured his royal master in reference to any marriage with Dudley, I am certain also that without your majesty's sanction, she will do nothing in public, or as rendered in the calendar of state papers, I am certain that if she do not obtain your majesty's consent, she will not dare to publish the match. Their dilemma resulted in a duplicitous diplomatic strategy designed by Elizabeth and Dudley via foreign ambassadors and diplomats, especially with a view of obtaining the approval and support of Philip II of Spain that continued for years. The issue of a public marriage was so grave and perilous a matter, so complex and so fraught with intractable difficulties on all sides, that it was dangerous to both the lives of Elizabeth and Dudley and the lives of the people of her, of her, her kingdom, through possible invasion or civil war, that it proved the critical Gordian knot of her reign. A near fatal smallpox attack in 1562 acutely focused attention on the question of her marriage status and the critical question of succession. On the 10th of October, Elizabeth was taken ill at Hampton Court Palace, where the pregnancy portrait now hangs, and within a week she had deteriorated to the point it was feared she would die. As she lay dying, as everybody then believed, with more than a dozen members of her Privy Council gathered around her, on recovering consciousness, the first thing Elizabeth did was instruct her council to make Lord Robert Dudley protector of the kingdom, with a title and income of £20,000. Even though she was not out of danger and conceivably still staring at the possibility of death, the consum consummate master of dissimulation conformed to type and blatantly lied through her teeth, protesting, she loved and had always loved Lord Robert dearly, but as God was her witness, nothing improper had ever passed between them. Several of her Privy Council present certainly knew this to be untrue, not least Cecil and Sir Nicholas Bacon, who had personally witnessed her marriage to Dudley at the home of the Earl of Pembroke and was now with his wife Lady Bacon secretly raising their royal offspring. Yet in her very next breath she transparently betrayed herself by crudely ordering that £500 a year hush money be paid to Dudley's groom of the chamber to make sure he kept quiet for the rest of his days. In the 
pregnancy portrait of Queen Elizabeth, two rings hang on a black cord from her neck. The one ring appears to be made of rubies with black stones, and the other gold with black stones. These two rings symbolically represent the secret marriage between Queen Elizabeth and Lord Robert Dudley, the mother and father of the person who commissioned the painting, which looks back to another painting of himself when only a child. At Gorenbury House, located on the Bacon family estate, built originally by Sir Nicholas Bacon, there hangs on display a unique oil painting of Francis Bacon as a young child, aged between one to two years old by an unknown artist. The oil painting was presumably commissioned by Sir Nicholas and Lady Anne Bacon around 1562, and it has very quietly passed down the descendants of the Bacon family during the last five centuries, overlooked by his orthodox editors and biographers. The existence of the painting became known to a small number of Baconian scholars in the second half of the 20th century, a number of whom reproduced it without providing any further commentary. It first received a detailed examination by Peter Dawkins in his Dedication to the Light, published in 1984, a work very little known outside of Baconian circles. For the first time, he produced an enlarged image of the painting, which made clearly visible a framed miniature suspended on a chain from the shoulders of a baby Francis that is completely central to its secret symbolic meaning and obscured message. In the portrait, Francis is depicted holding an apple in his right hand, carefully situated just below two framed miniatures, one of them larger that is concealing a smaller framed miniature. The apple is a universal symbol of knowledge and immortality and appears in several religious traditions as a mystical or forbidden fruit. It is the fruit growing in the Garden of Eden which God commands mankind not to eat, i.e. it is forbidden or disallowed by divine or royal authority. Adam and Eve eat the fruit from the tree of knowledge and are punished for it by being exiled from Eden. In Greek mythology, it shares similarities with Pandora's box, which contains hidden treasure or knowledge that when opened, reveals secrets hidden from the rest of mankind, which in this instance will bring down the wrath of divine royal authority and punishment if uttered out loud. The top miniature depicts what appears to be a bearded nobleman with ladies kneeling on each side of him. The most reasonable explanation for the miniatures is that they are intended to portray Francis's parents, and at first glance one would think the top visible portrait was that of his father, with the portrait of his mother hidden from view underneath. But why hide the picture of his mother? Surely this would either be an insult to his mother, supposedly Lady Anne Bacon, or else the painter was instructed by the two parents to deliberately paint it this way. The latter must certainly have been the case, as Nicholas Bacon would certainly not have insulted his wife. It seems to be portraying the man's right arm raised as if about to forcibly smite or reject the woman kneeling before him to his right and falling backwards from him whilst he looks over his head whilst the other woman, kneeling on his left and slightly behind him in the shadows, clings to him and holds onto his right arm. Following the same symbolic basis of the larger portrait of Francis, this miniature would seem to be depicting the forcible and uncaring rejection of a lover, a mistress or even a wife by the man, even to the extent of a physical injury being given to her. Whilst the inward urge giving rise to this action lies with his close relationship with the woman clinging to his left arm. This is not Sir Nicholas's story, but it is the tale of Francis's real father, Robert Dudley, Earl of Leicester. If this really is what the painter was trying to convey, then it also makes absolute sense of why the portrait miniature of the mother is concealed, she being too regal and well-known a personage not to be noticed if displayed, and to whom complete secrecy as to her motherhood was essential if she were to maintain her public image as the Virgin Queen. Around the time Sir Nicholas and Lady Anne Bacon commissioned the oil painting of a young Francis, his royal mother, Queen Elizabeth, instructed Roger Ascham, one of the greatest scholars of his time, to write his famous book, The Schoolmaster. 
He had in the previous decades tutored and studied with Elizabeth at the Chelsea home of her stepmother, Queen Catherine Parr, and during the Marian reign at Hatfield. When Elizabeth ascended the throne, she appointed Ashen her Latin secretary, a post he held for the remainder of his life, which meant he attended upon her almost daily, and after dinner most evenings, they studied their favourite Greek and Latin works. It was during one of these congenial occasions, when Ashen dined at Windsor Castle with Cecil and other members of the Privy Council, that it was suggested to him he should write a work that became the schoolmaster. That night he suddenly was called to come to the Queen. The night following I slept little. My head was so full of this our former talk, and I so mindful somewhat to satisfy the honest request of so dear a friend. I thought to prepare some little treaties for a New Year's gift that Christmas. What exactly passed between Elizabeth and Asham is not known, but whatever it was resulted in him being unable to sleep that night and likely for a few nights after. It is distinctly possible, given his reaction, that some secret was discussed which prompted him to write the schoolmaster, a treatise on the teaching of Latin, especially prepared for the private bringing up of youth in gentlemen and noblemen's houses, such as, of course, a young Francis, son of Queen Elizabeth, now being raised in the household of Sir Nicholas and Lady Anne Bacon. It appears the writing of the work was protracted and delayed for a variety of reasons. The preface to the printed edition was apparently written shortly before Ascham's death in 1568, in which he thanked Cecil for giving him the hope that enabled him to finish it. Nearly two years passed before it was first printed by John Day, who had a long history and relationship, some of it secret, with the Cook, Bacon, Cecils, who in the same year printed Lady Anne, ba Lady Anne Cook Bacon's translation of Aquino's sermons. There was, however, missing from the edition another dedication dated 30th of October 1566, entitled Divi Elizabetha by Ascham, that was originally suppressed and thereafter concealed and hidden, perhaps to begin with by Cecil, or more likely Sir Nicholas and Lady Bacon, and afterwards by Francis Bacon and members of his rosy Crucian Brotherhood, before it quietly emerged nearly 200 years later in 1761. It was first published by Ascham's editor, James Bennett, without any fanfare or commentary, with only the f following single line at the bottom of its first page. The letter to Queen Elizabeth is now first published from a manuscript. On account of the quiet method of delivery without discussion and analysis, followed by more silence and suppression, I imagine the contents of this dedication to Queen Elizabeth by her tutor Roger Ascham, who for many years from the outset of her reign attended upon her almost daily, is unfamiliar to the non-specialist reader, and for very good reason. In Divi Elizabethae, he would leave to posterity a document of the utmost historical importance, revealing that he knew Elizabeth was no virgin and that she had, during the early years of her tenure as Queen of England, given birth to a royal child. In the dedication, presented in the form of a letter, Ascham likens Elizabeth's life to that of the biblical story of King David. The parallels he draws between Elizabeth and David are pointed and unmistakable and reveal that he is intimately familiar with key aspects of her secret life. King David is captivated by the beautiful Bathsheba and commits adultery with her and murders her, her husband Uriah. After his death, David and Bathsheba married and their first surviving son was Solomon. Similarly, Elizabeth and Dudley committed adultery and were accused of conspiring to murder his wife, Lady Amy, to make way for their own marriage, whose union produced a royal child known to history as Francis Bacon, another baby Solomon wise beyond his years, who later named his scientific institution Solomon's House in New Atlantis.
He was clearly aware that Queen Elizabeth had a secret child with Dudley, which he hints at on several occasions. For he, David, heard of God's own mouth, thine seed shall fit in thy seat. And even more strikingly, from God's own mouth by Nathan's message, which all true English hearts daily do pray, that God will send the same unto your majesty. I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. He repeatedly reminds Elizabeth of this race of David's life, his safety to his posterity, which Asham likens to her own life and state of your majesty. In the very last sentence, he re twice refers to her posterity. In the end, have as David had, that is, most prosperity and surest felicity for you, yours and your posterity. The repeated use of the word seed and posterity refers to the succession, her royal heir, one, if she named him, was destined to become King of England and ensure the Tudor name and progeny passed down to future generations. Shortly after the publication of The Schoolmaster, without the suppressed dedication to Elizabeth, one of Mary Queen of Scots followers, the Catholic Bishop of Galloway, preached a remarkable sermon against Queen Elizabeth, where he also likened her to King David as a sinner, an adulterer and a murderer. Saint David was a sinner and so is she. Saint David was an adulterer and so is she. Saint David committed murder in slain Uriah for his wife and so did she. I doubt not but you consider that no inferior subject has power to depose their lawful magistrates, although they commit whoredom, murder, incest or any other crime. In early 1565, Elizabeth was again pregnant with another child by Robert Dudley, now Earl of Leicester. On the 10th of November 1565, Robert Devereux, the future second Earl of Essex, was born, so it is said at Netherwood, Herefordshire, the son of Walter Devereux, first Earl of Essex, and his wife, Lettice Knollys, who, for the first decade of his life, about which virtually nothing is known, was mostly raised away from prying eyes on the family estate at Chartley, around 150 miles from the Elizabethan court. In the decades ahead, the relationship between Elizabeth and her two concealed royal children, Francis and Robert, dominated the political landscape of the final part of her life, ending in a terrible tragedy when the latter overreached himself for the crown, events shadowed in the background of a pregnancy portrait. The fact that Francis and Robert were concealed royal brothers was also captured in a portrait overlooked for centuries. In the middle of the 20th century, Dr. Gerstenberg drew attention to an illustration by Adrian van der Werf in Isaac de Larry's four volume, History of England, Scotland and Ireland, printed at Rotterdam in 1707. An interpretation of the Queen Elizabeth Vestal Flame portrait with its three children, one in the shadowy background dousing the Vestal Flame, the sacred fire of Vesta representing the Vestal Virgins, and two other royal children, Francis and Robert Tudor was provided by Professor Henrion, who was in no doubt as to its import and meaning. Professor Gerstenberg's very interesting find not only provides one more in the already long list of pointers to Queen Elizabeth's real matrimonial condition, but affords an excellent example of the paramount importance of context. Below the portrait is the essential feature, the altar on which, in honour of the Virgin Queen, blazes the flames of the Vestal Fire. Behind, in the dark and the smoke of the fire, lurks an obscure child, with a gentleman's hose and an orphan's cloak, who grasps in his right hand the semi-spherical -semi extinguisher which fits the altar focus. The most inconvenient way in which he holds it leaves no doubt as to his gesture, he is going to cap the focus with it and extinguish the Vestal fire, as our modern Vesta is no longer worthy of the name. 
This is the firstborn child whose conception in sin invalidated the Queen's much publicised claim to maidenhood. The child is in the dark, firstly because this fact is not for public consumption. The other two children, half-brothers to the first, being born in wedlock, are in full light. Besides, they become men of much greater note, one a general, the other a chancellor. They have nothing to do with the fire because their mother has long ceased to be a devotee of Vesta when she bore them. They do not even look at the portrait of their ungrateful mother. Robert on the left looks his brother directly in the eye as he holds up in front of him his palm of a martyr a martyr to his mother's unnatural relentlessness. He also wears a paludamentum, that vestment held by a clasp on the right shoulder and reserved to imperators, Roman commanders-in-chief. It is often used by artists to symbolise generalship, as Van der Werf does here for Essex. Francis, in the middle, holds a rudder of ancient design. Notice the helm at the top left, since he was destined to hold the helm of state and ears of corn since he cared for peace and prosperity more than military adventures. The Queen's cousin, Thomas Howard, 4th Duke of Norfolk, was aware of the secret private marriage of Elizabeth and Dudley and that she had given birth to an unacknowledged son and heir. Shortly after, in his Confessions for High Treason, he records that when the court was at Guildford, seeing a young child with both Elizabeth and Leicester in her private apartments, delightfully playing a lute and singing to them. When the court was at Guildford, he came unaware into the Queen's privy chamber and found Her Majesty sitting on the threshold of the door, listening with one ear to a little child who was singing and playing on the lute to her, and with the other to Leicester who was kneeling by her side. The Duke, a little confused, no doubt, at interrupting a party so conveniently arranged, drew back, but Her Majesty bade him enter. Soon after Leicester rose and came to Norfolk, leaving the Queen listening to the child, and told him, that he was dealing with the Queen in his behalf when he approached. How then can we be confident the child singing and playing the lute to Elizabeth and Leicester, seen by Norfolk, was their concealed son Francis? The answer has always been hidden in plain sight right in front of the eyes of the world, as this and more occasions like it were later recalled by Bacon in one of his Shakespeare sonnets. Mark how one string, sweet husband to another, strikes each in each by mutual order resembling sire and child and happy mother, who all in one pleasing note do sing. In 1571, Parliament passed the Treasons Act, which made it treason to intend bodily harm to the Queen, or levy war to, or incite others to make war against her, to affirm she had no right to the Crown, but some other person, or to publish the Queen as a heretic, schismatic, tyrant, infidel, or usurper of the Crown, or to claim right to the Crown, or to affirm the right of succession of the Crown in some other than the Queen, or to say the laws and statutes do not bind the descent or inheritance concerning the succession to the throne. This is followed by Whosoever shall during the Queen's life by any book or work written or printed expressly affirm, before the same be established by Parliament, that any one particular person is or ought to be heir or successor to the Queen, except the same, but the natural issue of her body, or shall willfully set up in open place, or spread any books or scrolls to that effect, or shall print, bind, or put to sale, or utter, cause, etc., any such book or writing, he, his abbotters, and councillors, shall for the first offence be a whole year imprisoned, and forfeit half his goods, and for the second time shall incur the penalty of a premium year. The great Elizabethan historian William Camden was 20 years old when this act of treason was passed by Parliament. He entered Oxford in 1566, the year the Earl of Leicester celebrated his appointment as Chancellor of the University with a grand reception for Elizabeth.
preface to his Annals of Queen Elizabeth. It is clear that Camden is aware of the sensitivity of writing what was the first history and biography of Elizabeth, with its repeated references to the truth. Not unlike the truth referred to by Dr. Rawley in the Resuscitato, with its first English biography of Bacon, whereby I shall not tread too near upon the heels of truth, or of the passages and persons then concerned. And, in the vein of Dr. Rawley, Camden gives enough of a hint of the truth regarding the reason for the precise wording of the 1571 Act of Treason. This seemed harsh to some who were of the opinion that it would make for the tranquillity of the realm if an heir apparent were designed. But incredible it is what jests those that lewdly catch at words made amongst themselves upon occasion of that clause, except the same be the natural issue of her body, forasmuch as the lawyers term those children natural who are gotten out of wedlock, whom nature alone and not honest wedlock have begotten, and those they call lawful, according to the ordinary form of the common law of England, who are lawfully procreated of the body. Insomuch as I myself, being then a young man, have heard some oftentimes say that that word was inserted into the act of purpose by Leicester, that he might one day obtrude upon the English some bastard son of his for the Queen's natural issue. What Cam Camden wanted to say was the specific intentions behind the change in wording in the 1571 Act of Treason was Elizabeth and Leicester wished to legally pave the way to ensure the acceptance of her natural issue, if in future they decided to publicly name their rightful successor to the throne. Regarding any problems or disputes that may arise in gaining acceptance for her private marriage and firstborn child, Elizabeth, no doubt with the full support of Dudley, refused to have the word lawful annexed to the natural issue of her body. The fact their first child was conceived out of a wedlock would thus not lawfully prove an impediment, and if circumstances allowed, they had preempted any opposition to one day naming their royal heir. Sometime in September 1576, Bacon, as related through his word and by literal cipher systems, learned he was the royal son of Queen Elizabeth and Robert Dudley, Earl of Leicester. He had previously been entered at Gray's Inn on the 27th of June, fully expecting to commence his studies in law, whereas the open facts of history show this did not occur, and sometime in the autumn it was decided by Queen Elizabeth and Dudley that he was to be sent to France in the train of Sir Aeneas Paulette. When Sir Nicholas and Lady Anne Bacon discovered Elizabeth had decided that the child they had reared as their own for the last 15 years was to be sent abroad to France, they were understandably upset, and both of them in their own way made overtures to the Queen, which predictably fell on deaf ears. With all the preparations finally completed, Sir Amias Paulette, English ambassador elect of France, and his large entourage, including Francis and painter Nicholas Hilliard, prepared themselves for the journey across the Channel. The memory of his departure lived with Bacon for the rest of his days. Writing some two decades later in a letter to his cousin Cecil, he refers to having served Elizabeth for these one and twenty years, for so it is that I kissed Her Majesty's hand upon my journey to France, and at the same time to his royal brother, the Earl of Essex, of serving, now these twenty years, for so long it is and more, since I went with Sir Amias Paulette into France from Her Majesty's royal hand. The three years Bacon spent in France are to the present day still shrouded in secrecy, largely on account of his royal birth and his concealed authorship of the Shakespeare poems and plays, several of which are partly based in or relate to the French Kingdom. Love's Labour's Lost, King John, Henry VI, Part 1 and 3, Henry V, All's Well That Ends Well, and As You Like It, with its pointed weeping stag scene as portrayed in the pregnancy portrait of Queen Elizabeth. 
Later in life, he reckoned these years in France to have been among the most formative for his personal and intellectual development. I was, he wrote, three of my young years bred with an ambassador in France, a kingdom he evidently fell in love with and its princess, Margaret Valois, his Juliet in Romeo and Juliet. His close companion in Paris, the miniature painter Nicholas Hilliard, had most probably known Bacon years before they both arrived in France in the train of Sir Amy's Paulette. Sometime in the early 1570s, Hilliard was appointed goldsmith, jeweller and limner to Queen Elizabeth, whom he painted on numerous occasions over the next years and decades. The first of his many portrait miniatures of Queen Elizabeth is dated 1572, and on the 9th of January 1573, he received the first of several royal promises of tithes, with the grant of the reversion of a lease of the rectory and church of Cleve in Somerset, and later, in the October, there is a warrant under the Privy Seal for payment of the large sum of £100 for some unspecified work. The famous phoenix and pelican portraits of Elizabeth are believed to have been painted by Hilliard or under his direction in the same workshop around 1575 and in 1576 Hilliard painted a miniature of Robert Dudley Earl of Leicester the year he travelled to France with Bacon. Sometime in 1578, Hilliard painted a miniature of Francis, then in his 18th year, with the following inscription, If only I could paint his mind. It is not known who commissioned the miniature of Francis. It may possibly have been commissioned by Sir Nicholas and Lady Bacon, or even by Francis himself, or more likely it was commissioned by Hilliard's patron, Queen Elizabeth, the royal mother of the sitter. The likeness of the three miniatures of Queen Elizabeth Robert Dudley Earl of Leicester and Francis all bear an unmistakable striking resemblance to each other, the true significance of which, if not already known, would no doubt not have been lost on a great artist like Hilliard. They simply look like what they are, three miniature portraits of a mother, father and their son, namely Queen Elizabeth, her husband Robert Dudley Earl of Leicester and Francis, the concealed Tudor, Prince of Wales and heir to the royal throne of England. In the pregnancy portrait, Queen Elizabeth crowns Bacon, there transmuted into the weeping stag, and in the later painting of him as Lord Chancellor, the stick in his hand points down to the braiding on the lower hem of his cloak, which has been modelled to form a crown, befitting his royal status as the unacknowledged King of England. <laughs> 